I'd like to welcome you all to this service. I ask that you pray for me as I go through this sermon. I know it's going to be hard. But the resemblance is so close, brings so much memory. We are gathered here this morning by reason of death. What can we say? What can we say about this death? For those of you who are serving the Adventists, we have been studying this whole quarter about death, dying, and our hope in the resurrection. Doesn't it seem a little bit intriguing that this death happens at such a time? You know, last Saturday evening, we were supposed to be here. We are having some preaching seminars here and we're supposed to meet. And when we got here, the sentiment was everywhere. The mood around the church is down. And I guess these are the people who are studying about the hope in the resurrection. Why should the mood be down? You know what? In the immediate impact of this kind of death, if you know what I mean, the concept of resurrection can be very emotionally challenging. If you have been there, you understand what I mean. Because you see, with the impact of this kind of death, you begin talking about resurrection, it feels too academic, remote, even vacuous for believers. But as for non-believers, people who know nothing, but sometimes think that they have much education, the concept of resurrection is intellectually challenging. They would argue that death is death, both for the believer and for the unbeliever. And it doesn't matter, it doesn't make any difference. After all, they remind you of that poet who wrote the poem, the 17th century poet, who wrote the poem, Death is the Leveler, where he says, death comes to all and all are made equal in death. And that reminds me of a story I have told often about the Greek philosopher, that great Greek philosopher, his name is Diogenes. The story goes that he was standing by a pile of human bones and staring intently at those bones. Close by was Alexander the Great. And as Alexander the Great watched Diogenes standing intently at the bones, he went close and said, Father, what are you doing here? Diogenes replied, I'm trying to search through these bones to see the bones of your father. But I can't seem to make any difference between his bones and the bones of the slave. The point was very clear to Alexander. All are equal in death. See, that is only partially true. Because Christians have always believed that having Jesus, being a true believer in Jesus, makes a difference at death. Christians have always believed what Jesus told Martha. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet he shall live. So in spite of the pain, 
in spite of the hardship, in spite of the misunderstandings, we still believe this. I have seen in our times, as I said, some people who feel that they are educated, they know much more than God himself. Modern people, skeptical people, express all kinds of skepticism about the resurrection. I'm not surprised that a recent survey in the United States of Christians, 50% of Christians said they do not believe in the resurrection. It's la la land, fantasy land. And so you read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 35 to 49, can even go on to the end of the chapter, and you realize that this kind of skepticism is not new. It was alive and well among the Christians at Corinth. Now let me read the text again to you. 1 Corinthians 15, and I'm reading from verse 35 to 38 from the New American Standard Bible. Paul says, after his argument, but someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? See, two key questions there. The first question of the skeptics, how are the dead raised? This is a question about me the mechanics, the process by which dead people can be raised. It seems incredible. It seems fantastical. So they ask, how can the dead be raised? Then there is a second question. And with what kind of body do they come? This has to do with the form with which dead people, if they are indeed going to be raised, will be raised. Now, Paul deals very sharply with this criticism. And he remarks that such criticism, such skepticism is actually foolish and worthless. Why? He continues to argue, if only such people, if only these skeptics would pay attention, resurrection has parallels in the activities that they are all familiar with. So he continues, you fool, that which you sow does not come to life until it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body, which is to be a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. So the first, the first question, how do dead people wake up or rise up has to do with the mechanics. And what Paul is saying is that if you only pay attention, look at how we do sowing, look at how we farm. You put in the ground, a grain of corn or wheat or whatever, and notice what happens. Once that grain goes into the ground, it rots, it decays, it becomes inextinguishable, and yet, lo and behold, with rain or sunshine, before you know it, something pops up. And Paul is saying, think about it. Resurrection has this parallel in farming. The body will be sown, but just the same way the seed that is sown rots and dies and comes up, in the same way, a human body put in the ground should not be fantastical to you at all. If God can raise that grain and bring new fruit out of it, then God has the power to raise that person who was sold in the heart of the earth and raise him up again. Why should this be so difficult to understand? Then he pursues the argument with the same metaphor of story. Because the second question was, 
With what kind of body are they going to come? And he says, think about it. When you put wheat or beans in the ground, I mean, let's use beans, black-eyed beans. It looks black and white. You put it in the ground. What did you put in the ground? It was a round or perhaps circular kind of thing that you put in the soil. Let rain fall, let the sun shine. What comes up? Something that is totally unlike what you put in the ground. Something green, vigorous, vibrant, and growing, beautiful. If that dark brown, black thing that you put in the ground came up as green, vibrant, and growing, why do you ask with what kind of body would they come? Just think. The resurrection is not so incredible at all. So skepticism about the resurrection, according to Paul, is because people don't have the knowledge. They don't know what they are talking about. And since that is the problem, Paul says, wait, let me give you that knowledge which you lack and for which reason you are skeptical about the resurrection. And you can continue reading the chapter, but I want to jump to verse 51. Verse 51, Paul says, Behold! Other translation said, look, it's a surprise. Behold, I tell you a mystery. A mystery is something that people don't know. And so what Paul is saying is that, hey, you guys, let me tell you something that you don't know. You doubt this. Let me tell you something that you don't know. And then Paul says, here is the mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all change. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. What is Paul saying? He's saying that when Christ comes, there will be some people who are still alive. But those who are dead will come up. But those who are alive, together with those who are dead, will all be changed. When Jesus comes, whether alive or dead, we will all be changed. You know why? He explained. Back in verse 50. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. The reason we shall all be changed is that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now, beautiful, Paul goes on. After he says that we shall all be changed, he goes on to tell us the circumstances. He describes the circumstances under which the change will take place. Notice verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and will be changed. You know, trumpets, in the days of Israel, in their history, in their culture, trumpets were blown for basically two reasons. First, when there were festive occasions, like an anniversary or something, among the Jews, they would blow trumpets, the shofar. If they went to war and they were victorious, they would blow the trumpet. Now what Paul is saying is that this festive, triumphant trumpet that he's talking about here in verse 52 will be blown at the last when Christ is about to appear and the dead will be raised incorruptible. And now Paul expands on the reason why we should be changed 
And that one should be incorruptible in verse 53. First Corinthians 15, 53. For this perishable must put on the imperishable. And this mortal must put on immortality. See what Paul is saying? I don't know how much care you give to your body. All the lotions. Paul's point is this. This body of mine, this body of yours that you care about so much, is subject to weakness, decay, and finally, whether you like it or not, if Christ has not come, it will succumb to death. Our bodies are weak, decaying. These bodies that we have are incompatible with the realities in the kingdom to come. Therefore, we must put on that which is incorruptible. So friends, not too long from now, this body out there, the body of Kenneth, will be sown like seed in the earth. And it wouldn't be too long either. The trumpet will sound. And unlike the seed, which is quickened with rain and sunshine and heat, Kenneth's body and the bodies of all who have fallen in Christ, at the sound of the trumpet, that body will be quickened by the Spirit of God. And it will be clothed with incorruptibility and immortality. Now Paul tells us what happens after that change. It's beautiful, 54 and 55. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal would have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Death, oh death, where is your victory? Oh, then, where is your sting? Friends, you know that text is a hymn? It's a hymn that will be sung by all those who have fallen in Christ that at the sound of the trumpet will come up and they will sing that hymn. I am looking forward to that day when with a throng I will join that chorus. Sing that chorus. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? But I want you to notice something there. Those who are redeemed are able to sing that hymn because Sin, which is the sting of death, would have been removed from human habitation forever. I want you to catch it. Death itself is not the problem. Death itself is not that which is harmful. That which is harmful is sin. And the sting of death is sin. See, when a bee bites you, that which causes you the pain is the sting. What good news? The sting, like a bee sting, which leads to death, is taken away through the victory in Christ Jesus and his blood. That is the good news. Let me wrap this up. Thinking about the sting of death, I'm reminded of a story about a man who was traveling with his son somewhere in America. It was summer. The windows of the car were all down. They were driving through the country. All of a sudden, a bee flies through the window into the car. 
Now they know that the son is seriously alleged to be staying. So this be flashing to the car and the child knowing what did happen to him, start bumping back and forth, trying to avoid the bee from singing him. As a child is doing that, the father reaches out his hand and grabs the bee for a while. Holds the bee in his hand for a while and opens the arm and calls the son. Son, come see. The son was still, you know, bumping back and forth because he knew the bee was thinking. But the father opened the arm and the son saw the sting of the bee in the father's hand. And this is what the father said. Look, son, his stinger is gone. He can't hurt you any longer. The stink of death is sin, but Jesus has overcome with his blood. And in him, we are as sinless as Christ himself. The sting of death no longer will hurt us. Now watch verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, in some sense it's true. Death is a leveler. It comes to all. But with what I understand from scripture, I have resolved to avail myself with the sin overcoming blood of Jesus Christ every day in my life. That will give me the certain hope that though I die, I will live again. And to you, Shadrach, Emilia, and Freema, the words from the pen of inspiration to you today is this. Though you have grief that lie too deep to be breathed into any human ear, God says to you, look to me and live. Look to me and live. Amen. Amen.